go. Hello, friends. How's everybody doing today? Good. Good. Excellent. So glad to see you all here. So uh, I have the enviable responsibility of introducing President Kennedy in the context in which he worked in 1960, mostly so that I can set up my colleagues, Drs. Harper and Vela. So uh, what I would like to start with is just a, a, a brief uh, rundown of uh, Kennedy's early career before moving really into the 1960 presidential election and his, uh, his uh, presidential policy package known as the New Freedom. Kennedy was, as many people know, born to an Irish family in Brookline, Massachusetts in 1917. Uh, he had what appears to all to be a meteoric rise to national power. Uh, a Harvard education came uh, with graduation in 1940. A Second World, War, uh, Second World War II career as a lieutenant in the Navy, commanding a PT boat in the South Pacific. Uh, Kennedy also had an education in economics at the University of London and was studying on a graduate level as a young man. He was elected uh, to House of Representatives, representing a working class district from Boston, Massachusetts. He serves in the House from 1947 to 1953 before moving on to the Senate from 1953 to 1960. All of this is, I promise, not merely to recite dry historical facts, but to set up Kennedy as a rising star in the Democratic Party. This was a person on the edge of wielding great power. This was somebody who was a rising star in the Democratic Party. He was bandied about in the mid-1950s as a potential presidential leader of the future, and then four years later, 1960, a first ballot nominee for the Democratic Party's uh, nominee for the office of president, much to OBJ's chagrin, it must be said. JFK promised Americans powerful leadership, but what that leadership would look like took shape not from Kennedy himself, but from a close personal advisor, a man by the name of Richard Newtsat. Newtsat is the uh, author of the uh, powerful and historically important presidential power released in 1960. Now Newtsat was not just any advisor. Newtsat had been inside the Truman White House in the early 1950s. He had a, a position to observe presidents at power in the years after the Second World War and the opening years of the Cold War. And he had seen presidents with a war chest that Americans had never known, right? The American economy's booming in the post-war period. Newsat had moved on after the Truman White House to hold academic positions at both Cornell and Columbia University. And so he publishes his book in 1960, part as a work of academic work of a political scientist, but also as part of a reflection on what he himself has observed in Washington, D.C. during the early 1950s. If we were to distill this book's argument down to one clear idea, it's this. Newtstand argued presidential power is the power to persuade. Newtstand's interpretation of the most powerful presidents in modern American history was that people expected the president to achieve ends beyond the power that the Constitution gave the president. Thus, big problems called for big men and executive leaders who pushed through restraints. To some extent, you would say, argue, great presidents are defined by the context in which they must act. It gives them problems and opportunities to exert power. You want to be a good president? Helps to be a president during the Depression. Want to be a great president? It helps to have a world war break out. You want to be a great president? It helps to have the post-war civil rights movement gaining momentum when you're coming into office. And there was a need for this too, right? A powerful president. Americans of 1960, quite honestly, were uncomfortable. It's popular to remember the 1950s and 60s as Hollywood days of sorts and American power and privilege. And they were to some extent, absolutely. Americans were better educated, better fed, better taken care of than any other point uh, uh, since the 1950s uh, or before the 1950s. 
But at the same time, Americans were quite uncomfortable with the new role the nation had assumed since the end of the Second World War as the global police. Americans were concerned about the rise of minority issues, of women's rights issues, of the rediscovery of poverty in the Delta and in Appalachia. So a lot of Americans felt like as the so-called greatest generation aged and gave rise to the boomer generation, that America was drifting from what it seemed like a wonderful point in time when the United States could point to themselves and say, look, we did it. We've defeated Nazis, we've defeated the Depression, nothing can stop us now. JFK was, at first glance, not necessarily the person Newtstadt would have picked. He was seen as less experienced than his opponent, Richard Nixon. He was outperformed for many months in policy debates and statements. Americans were very happy with the Republican leadership of the 1950s, grandfather president after grandfather president. But the turning point, as many uh, fans of JFK and students of Lecture will know, came with a famous tele series of telephone tele televised TV debates where Nixon's advisors dressed him in a way that did not necessarily reflect vibrancy on this new medium of television, whereas JFK's uh, inner circle had him dressed in a way that made him show up as healthy and vibrant. Nixon would come away from these debates looking a bit like the grandfathers of the decade before, where Kennedy would come away looking like your full uncle. In reality, by the way, the two men were only separated by five years of age. They were essentially the same people, generationally. The Kennedy campaign, uh, campaign would pour it on, pictures of Kennedy playing touch football with his brothers at the family estate, pictures trotting out, him with his beautifully vibrant wife and cherubic offspring. This was a candidate who was in touch with where America was going. This was a candidate who was prepared to act. And even better, he had something to say. In his inaugural speech, Kennedy would tell Americans, we stand at the edge of a new frontier, the frontier of unfulfilled hopes and dreams. It will deal with unsolved, unsolved problems of peace and war, unconquered pockets of ignorance and prejudice, unanswered questions of poverty and surplus. How perfectly Kennedy tied together space-age realities with a admittedly mythical American past to the frontier. Americans felt like everything great possibly had been done by 1960. Kennedy was there to tell them, fire up your Conestoga wagons and get ready to go to the moon. There's more to do. There's more to conquer. This resonated with a country growing younger. American, America demographically is shifting younger and younger and younger with each decade between the end of the Second World War and the 1980s. Young Americans of 1960 represented what one sociologist of that decade would call a newfound generation gap. A gap between this young America and their beliefs and that of their parents and their grandparents. And for this young group of people, Kennedy represented a chance. A chance to show their parents that the greatest generation hadn't done everything great in the United States there was still work left to do. The new frontier, as Kennedy's policy program would be called, had broad goals at home and abroad. It meant to boost the economy, which was beginning to plateau in the early 1960s after almost 20 years of sustained growth. It looked to provide international aid, to provide for a strengthened national defense, and to spur the space program. At home, if we were going to distill the new frontier down to a basic idea, we could say he wanted to make life fairer for more people. The new frontier sought to control monopoly prices, and all this, although this made him unfair with large corporations, it did prevent consumers from being forced to pay more than what products were worth at a time when inflation was going to start catching up with the rising cost of living. Kennedy was also an advocate of civil rights, although he was unsuccessful in passing legislation during his lifetime. I won't say much more than that. I'm going to leave the, uh, that, that ground for my colleague, Dr. Harper, 
uh, to cover, but I will say that Kennedy paved the way for reform that would come later. He also managed to increase the minimum wage and expand it to a broader pool of American workers. But by and large, Kennedy's social agenda was stymied. He looked at economic growth to prove his legendary leadership capabilities to become the president that Newstat argued he could be. However, he understood that the power he must wield, according to Newstat's formula, being able to bargain, being able to cajole, being able to get people to play ball, depended precariously upon a Southern majority. He's thinking back to the 1940s. He's thinking back to one of his predecessors, Truman, in the infamous Dixie Crack Revolt that Truman had had to try and weather to get elected. Again, I won't rat holes down into 1940s politics, but Truman had gotten a little sideways with conservative Southern Democrats by inserting a civil rights platform in the Democratic uh, platform in 1948 leading Strom Thurmond, the famous South Carolina senator, to bolt the party with other Southern conservatives and to threaten what looked to be a fairly certain Democratic victory. So not wanting to tickle that particular shark's chin too much, Kennedy moved only very cautiously in, with civil rights measures. Kennedy would become somebody who Americans remembered as a moving figure after his death. I'm reminded of the conversation I had only two or three mornings ago uh, at our house. Uh, we have a, a small guitar. It's an old uh, Persephone from the early 1960s. It belonged to my late father-in-law, who was a, a Peace Corps worker in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, Jerry was not the guy you thought would join the Peace Corps. He was raised on a 500-acre corn farm in rural Indiana and had to talk his parents into letting him go to college down the road at Purdue 30 minutes away to get a teaching degree. And then as far as family legend goes, one day he's wandering through the student union and notices a sign saying that a uh, Peace Corps recruit was going on. You can stop in and, and, and hear a little bit about this program that Kennedy uh, recently had advocated for. Kennedy, by the way, mentioned some sort of peace volunteer organization while on the campaign trail, but never really thought anything would come up. He's basically pandering to college students when he mentions it. But then people started writing letters into him saying, when's this Peace Army thing going to happen? So he was moved to start what then became uh, the Peace Corps under the guidance of uh, one of his family members, Sergeant Schreiber. Jerry stopped for 30 minutes dropped out of college for a couple of years and spent some time in Brazil, collected that guitar and met my mother-in-law in the process. He missed Kennedy's assassination, but the family story is that uh, he had joined the Peace Corps because he wanted to do what Kennedy had called him to do. And he hadn't really known what that was going to be until he saw that sign and decided to stop at this meeting and it made a very uncomfortable call to his parents saying, I'm going to Milwaukee to learn Portuguese in six weeks, uh, and I'll see you in a couple years after that. Sadly, Kennedy's 63 assassination probably did more than Kennedy the president did to move federal legislation forward on civil rights and other social justice matters. A lot of people look back at that event and point to that as the time when social justice movements began to unravel in the United States in many ways. Newt Act in 1968 was asked to re-release uh, the book he had written eight years earlier and to add in the epilogue his ideas about what Kennedy had actually done to live up to the concepts he laid out in that book. And Newt Stack quite appropriately said in a very academic way, mm -hmm. in that epilogue he said, quite frankly, it's not been enough time to really evaluate what Kennedy achieved. He also wrote this passage. Eight years have passed since his last paragraph were printed. Shortly, LBJ will retire with his reputation as a presidential politician, mortgage to the war he made his own at the point of Vietnam there. Before him, briefly, we had still another president catapulted into history by an assassin's bullet, John F. Kennedy. Kennedy was somebody who was not allowed to become significant on his own terms, ultimately, it was his death, Newstat argued, that made him a lasting figure and really what shaped 
what, what he meant to Americans. So with that, I turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Harlan. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. I really appreciate Dr. Anderson's comments and his ideas about Kennedy. I come to this talk from a couple perspectives. I am the Assistant Professor of African American History, and I'm going to dive with you into Kennedy's rather complex legacy for civil rights that Dr. Anderson alluded to. And I also come to this from a personal point of view. Um, I was raised with a mother who was born in 1962. So she was only a year old whenever President Kennedy's life was cut short, but like so many people her age, she idolized the Kennedys, and so I grew up with lots of Kennedy lore in my life. So the opportunity to put some of that personal, um, that, some of that personal interest of mine with my academics has, has been a delight, and I appreciate you being here today. JFK called civil rights a moral issue that faced our country, but he only called civil rights a moral issue after he had been publicly challenged by Alabama Governor George Wallace, who famously in 1963 attempted to block the desegregation of the University of Alabama and famously said, segregation now and segregation forever. It was only after George Wallace had thrown down that proverbial gauntlet that JFK thought to get back on the television that had served him so well in 1960 and actually tell the country that it was time to put our money where our mouth was on civil rights. What JFK could possibly have to offer a civil rights conversation, if you are looking at his presidential portrait and wondering what this red-haired son of Ireland could possibly have to offer, that's a completely fair thing to wonder. JFK was born with the proverbial spoon in his silver spoon in his mouth. He benefited from three generations of Irish American immigrants who had laid a foundation for him to be born filthy rich and into the elite of the Northeast. But despite being born as an incredibly privileged son of a very influential political family on both sides of his family tree, he had enough understanding of what his ancestors had suffered as Irish immigrants in the United States and as Irish citizens of Ireland colonized by England in the 1830s and 1840s. And as our first Irish Catholic president, who was regarded with more than a little suspicion by white Protestants throughout the United States, he did understand something of what it meant to be or experience discrimination. And this gave him a personal empathy for civil rights issues, particularly those that affected black Southerners. The Irish Catholic president did have a genuine personal conviction whenever it came to civil rights, even if he was terribly cautious in implementing any sort of lasting policy or paying much more than lip service to civil rights on the campaign trail in 1960. In fact, the civil rights conversation was the beating heart of the election of 1960. And more than a few people in the United States, as Dr. Anderson alluded to, were happy and comfortable with the Eisenhower administration and with Republican politics. And Republican contender for the office, Richard Nixon, he had not yet sullied his name as Tricky Dick. He was seen as the experienced, level-headed leadership that could take the United States into the 1960s. Kennedy was an untested greenhorn who had more than a few family and personal issues in addition to being Catholic that made him seem suspect to millions of Americans. It would take a profound moment toward the end of the campaign in the fall of 1960, plus a little bit more of the modernization that Dr. Anderson also alluded to that would enable his star to rise against the formidable contender of Richard Nixon. Kennedy, in so many ways, is the first modern presidential candidate. He really is your cool uncle in 1960. In addition to being blessed with a better hairline than Richard Nixon had and being much more photogenic than Richard Nixon could ever hope to be, 
he also had a battalion of people who were encouraging him to use the 1960s equivalent of social media to make his case to the American public. He's very much our first celebrity president, as you can see here. If you're not familiar with who these gentlemen are, this is your BTS of 1960. This is the Rat Pack. <laughs> Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Frank Sinatra, and Kennedy's own brother-in-law, Peter Lawford. Kennedy used these personal connections to Hollywood and to Las Vegas to his advantage on the campaign trail, and it certainly helped with black Americans that Sammy Davis Jr. was a happy person on the campaign trail to promote JFK's politics for 1960. He also appealed directly to students, creating campaigns that were, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that were designed specifically to entice the youth vote. So in addition to presenting a youthful front, the kind of president that we had not seen ever before, he also used media to his advantage to prove his bona fides as a new president for a new generation. The pivotal moment the real moment for his campaign, however, came in October of 1960. This image that you're looking at right here is created for a graphic novel depicting Kennedy's election. Um, you can look at this on PBS if you are interested. It's created by Owen Coveney. And this is a depiction of when Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested in Atlanta for participating in a sit-in movement in 1960. He was taken to a rural jail outside of Atlanta, and his wife, Coretta Scott King, who at the time was six months pregnant with their third child, was petrified that her husband would be lynched in jail. This was the final week before election in 1960, and neither Nixon nor Kennedy were interested in seeming to pander to the black vote. To give him credit, Nixon also had genuine civil rights convictions, and neither man wanted to be accused of pandering on such a sensitive issue. Kennedy, however, had a political ace up his sleeve in his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, who encouraged him to make a phone call to Mrs. King instead of making a public statement on television, through the press, or any other medium. By calling Mrs. King and assuring her that he would do everything in his power to make sure that MLK stayed safe and was released from jail in Georgia, when that story became public knowledge, that endeared Kennedy to black America and to an America that was progressing more broadly speaking. In fact, Martin Luther King Sr., MLK's father, made a public statement that he had a suitcase full of votes and he was going to make sure Kennedy got all of them. It worked. In a tight election, Kennedy pulled out victory over sitting Vice President Richard Nixon. The Greenhorn Senator from Massachusetts, the Irish American son who was only three generations removed from the votes at Ellis Island had become the first Catholic President of the United States. And he had specifically called out civil rights issues and endeared himself by appealing to the family of the most important civil rights leaders of the era. But would he actually be a civil rights president? My research says no. Not for a lack of wanting, but political expediency, and perhaps you can make the case for personal cowardice, kept him from fully embodying being our first modern civil rights president. Kennedy was tested from the moment that he entered the Oval Office. And to his credit, he did, in instances of gross civil rights violations, provide federal support for activists, particularly student activists, who were determined to bring the Jim Crow South into the 1960s. One of his first major national tests was the Freedom Rides that happened in the spring and the fall of 1961, where student activists rode throughout the South to desegregate bus stations and train terminals in states that were resolutely adhering to Jim Crow custom throughout the Deep South. Amid firebomb threats, 
beatings from, from the Klan, from police brutality that was coordinated with KKK efforts. Kennedy sent in federal marshals and police officers to ensure that the Freedom Riders arrived safely at their destinations. Kennedy also marshaled his brother, Attorney General Robert, Fitz, or excuse me, Robert Francis Kennedy, to mobilize U.S. Marshals to go into Mississippi a year later, whenever all hell broke loose at the University of Mississippi that was attempting to desegregate its campus with its first black student, Mississippi native James Meredith. This event is sometimes called the last battle of the Civil War because of the student population and the local population in Oxford, Mississippi that lashed back at the attempt to end what was called the Southern Way of Life in this resolutely neo-Confederate state. Twice in two major national events, Kennedy signaled that he was willing to put federal force behind protecting civil and human rights for black Southerners. And yet, he still remained lukewarm on pushing too hard for actual civil rights legislation. The Civil Rights Act of 1963 was ultimately a weak bill that he was not able to pass through the House on his own. And Kennedy was advised by the same people who encouraged him to reach out to Martin Luther King Jr.'s family in 1960 to back off of the civil rights issues in 1962 and 1963. Looking down the road to re-election in 1964, his brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, his attorney general, who was his own brother, Robert Francis Kennedy, encouraged him specifically not to become the civil rights president. And this was to the chagrin of millions of black Americans, millions of young people who supported the civil rights movement, and the people who had put a lot at personal risk to support him to become the first Irish Catholic president. In May of 1963, young people took to the streets in Birmingham, Alabama, a city that would gain the notorious name Bombingham just a few months later in a crusade where more than 1,000 elementary and junior high school age children took to the streets to protest ongoing discrimination and Jim Crow custom in that state. The children's crusade is what instigated a barrage of photos that are probably familiar to anyone who has looked at pictures from the civil rights era. Birmingham was the city of Bull Connor. It was the city of police dogs and of fire hoses that were set about on children as young as five years old. And this particular event gave Governor George Wallace the fire that he wanted and needed to defend segregation at the University of Alabama and to make himself an avatar for ongoing segregation and the ongoing quote-unquote Southern way of life in the southern region of the United States. Only after Wallace's infamous segregation now and segregation forever speech did Kennedy find it within himself to publicly address the United States and declare that civil rights was, in fact, a moral issue. This was an issue that every American had to reckon with for themselves and for what sort of country we were going to be a hundred years after the Emancipation Proclamation had been signed. This was a pivotal moment, not just for Kennedy, proving that he did have moral empathy for the civil rights movement and for the plight of marginalized Americans who were denied the full liberties of citizenship. It endeared him to the public once more. And nevertheless, it did not propel him to move effectively on legislation. That was why the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom was so important to Martin Luther King Jr., Bayard Rustin, Asa Philip Randolph, and a host of civil rights leaders that perhaps you've never heard of. The civil rights movement didn't evolve in the late 1950s and 1960s. This had been an ongoing movement that had engulfed the entirety of the early 20th century. And because Kennedy had had such a start and stop attitude towards civil rights, acting on it whenever it was expedient for him, backing off whenever he was advised not to become too embroiled in these issues lest he lose popularity with white voters, only to come back again at the 
the most grave of public moments, Martin Luther King Jr., who was considered the de facto face of the civil rights movement, decided that it was time to make good on a threat to hold a thousand-man march on Washington that had been roiling since the 1940s from earlier civil rights leaders. On August 28, 1963, a quarter of a million people came from across the United States onto the Washington Mall in front of the Lincoln Memorial to demand that President Kennedy act for jobs, freedom, and for full civil rights. This move was a calculated move by the big six civil rights organizations, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Southern Christian Leadership Association, the Urban League, the National Urban League, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and many more who came together to demand that the president finally and decisively act. It was designed to embarrass President Kennedy, and it worked. President Kennedy met with these leaders after King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech to 250,000 Americans that included ordinary folks and celebrities alike. The image that you're looking at here is President Kennedy looking decidedly uncomfortable, standing next to civil rights legend Asa Philip Randolph. Dr. King is featured here. And the young head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee John Lewis is featured right here. And despite how shaken he might look in this picture, John Lewis, who only passed away in the last few years after serving an incredible career in Congress as the representative for Georgia, said of this meeting that he remembered Kennedy being very glad to welcome all of these leaders into the Oval Office and glad to see that the American public so clearly supported civil rights issues and wanted to move the country beyond its Jim Crow past. It was not just a Southern problem, but clearly a national one. Kennedy would not have the opportunity to act on this goodwill that he saw stringing out of every corner of the United States. His life would be cut short in Dallas. I do not think he is a civil rights president but I definitely consider him to be a light who shined what was possible from his person, from his own personal experience, and from what he clearly had empathy to do. Empathy. Empathy is the starting point for any kind of monumental change. And what Kennedy could have done with that had he not been gunned down in Dallas? Well, there's a lot of alternative histories to be written, isn't there? <laughs> Um, as I said on the thing, I was, uh, I was a, a sophomore at the University of Dallas. I was 19 years old. And uh, it was Catholic, it's a Catholic university. So uh, a lot of the people on campus obviously felt he's our president and all that. So I remember we were, there was a group of us who were going to go over toward Love Field, trademark somewhere in between there and see him as he came back and all that uh, and then of course that didn't happen but i was leaving the dormitory and i saw a bunch of people coming towards the chapel which was right next to my dormitory and they were crying and you know when you asked what was going on they said this and everybody was watching the tv and we watched the tv for the next three or four days actually you know obviously uh, for a lot of different things that happened and some of what um, some of what i'll talk about i'll, I'll just go ahead and explain this as i get to very much anyway so this is my starting point. This is a picture from the Zapruder film. It, it plays interestingly in terms of a different set of, of a variety of theories about what did and didn't happen. Uh, one of the things that I watched this morning, I'll, I'll show you in, in a bit with this. The thing I was going to tell you a bit ago, though, was that uh, when I was looking at some things this morning, it took like 40,000 books on, on, this, uh, on this topic and all that. So you need to understand I didn't read all of them, or not even a bunch of them, <laughs> for that matter. At one o'clock, as we were sitting there, all of a sudden Walter Cronkite was the person on TV for most of us. That the Flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. The area of Dallas that we're looking at right here, maybe let me explain. 
This is Dealey Plaza up here. This particular map doesn't show the school book depository, which is up here. Um, the Adolphus Hotel is over here. And uh, if you were a college age at that time, there was a Texas OU weekend. And if you were wanted to go to one thing or the other, you just changed whatever your sign was and all that. So it was the Hookham Harms or, you know, whatever, and all that. Across from there is the two um, entertainment places, strip clubs, comedy clubs, basically uh, the uh, comedy club and the, um, and, and the carousel club that are right there. And that gives you just sort of a general way. One of the things that I'll bring up is the fact that you know, they could have just gone straight to the main street between these two and straight on out that way. And I'll have some illustrations that will give you a better sense of that in a minute. Uh, this is a card that was put out at the time, a detailed map of the assassination site. And you can see where the, uh, where the, where it says Sniper's Perch, that, that, that floor in the, in the school book depository and all that. And then the areas down below. And you can see the sort of triangular area. And back here is the fence that's talked about sometimes. In some of the, some of the recordings, there's the idea that, that, uh, that perhaps there was someone behind there. In one of the conspiratorial theories, there's the idea that it was actually someone from law enforcement, because I could see a blue uniform and a badge and all that sort of thing. Um, this is a, a picture of the thing, and it gives you a better idea. It's, it's from probably from about where Stimmons Freeway is going back. This is the, I'm sorry, I have to do it here, don't I? Anyway, this is the railroad when I first went to Dallas. Uh, I'd been born in Los Angeles, and, and we took the train to, uh, to Del Rio, Texas, where I grew up and all that. And I wanted to take the train again, too. So anyway, I took the train back further on that line, somewhere there is where the train station was. And that's part of the reason I'm, I'm familiar with some of this area in there. That, that's where I landed, you know, in Dallas and all. And, um, when, when this happened, of course, the, the, when he was shot and all that, they went to, took him to Parkland Hospital, which is down on Simmons Freeway. This area over here where it says the image shows not identified Catholic priest in the parking lot of Parkland Hospital on November 22nd, 1963. That's Father Thomas Kane. He was my philosophy professor. He had a, uh, a relic uh, and he went to the, uh, to the uh, hospital because he thought, it would make a difference somehow or other, you know what? Uh, he was, I don't know if I left the thing in here. Yeah, he, he had a, uh, there was a write-up in, in William Manchester's book on the assassination uh, where he really kind of said a lot of terrible things about Father King, sort of ridicules him in some ways and all that sort of thing. Um, there's not a lot I can say about it. It, 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 it raised a lot of irony in verses because we knew that he, he was not being reported as he was. A, uh, a, uh, from, talk about Parkland Hospital, a, a film and book that gives you a, sort of the broadest overview of what happened and pictures of pretty much everybody would be this Parkland. Uh, it's a large book, as all of them about Kennedy seem to be and all that. And the movie itself is interesting. It shows, it shows the police, it shows the pruder, it shows uh, a number of the people involved, it shows the Kennedys, it shows the Oswalds. The, the mother, for example, has said some things in there, I think she's in the next one. You know, a couple down from here and all that. But anyway, uh, you get a picture of the entire family and all. He has a brother named Robert. He has a, he has a wife who's Russian, as we reported earlier. And he has uh, his mother, Marguerite, who's a little strange. He's mentioned in books on, on, that talk about the family that way. Soon after that, LBJ is sworn in as the 36th president. And of course, Jackie is there beside him. And as we know, she did not change you know, what she was wearing and all that. Uh, there was a report that Oswald was arrested at the Oak Cliff, Texas Theater. He had apparently just recently shot Tippett right before then, and the idea was somehow or other that, that he went into the theater to try to hide. It's one of the, one of the stories that I've heard about this sort of thing and all that. But here he is there. This is um, Jack Ruby shooting Lee Harvey Oswald, and this is a flyer for the Carousel Club. Um, Promise me you won't repeat this. When I was in college, if, if you dressed nicely and acted right, you could get into almost any place. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, so when we went back to the dorm, you know, after the, uh, the assassination, we saw this thing and they showed a picture of Jack Ruby and we looked at each other and we're like, oh my God, that's the guy we saw. 
and all that, because he was actually at the club, and one of us that was a little bit less sober than the rest of us decided to leave. Where were you when I needed you? Okay. Um, after that, of course, the members of the Warren Commission report, present their report. LBJ went ahead and put the thing together. It came out in 64, which is really not so far after the events themselves. And you can go through some of the pictures and discussions and all that would give you some, some indication of who the people were on this. There's some questions about some of the folks. This is the thing I was trying to tell you about. William Manchester's the death of the president. Uh, it, was, it was put out as almost a kind of, um, um, blessed or sanctioned kind of report of the thing. And so here's a, a note that he had a, in it. I think it's towards the end. Miss Kennedy realized that she and the others would be advised to share the recollection of the National Tragedy with a responsible writer. And she and Senator Robert Kennedy asked Mr. Manchester to set down the history of the assassination in the days immediately preceding and following it. And like I said, he has a, the comments about uh, Father Kane in there. Almost immediately there were doubts and theories and reactions to the entire thing. I'll just go through a few of them. Um, almost immediately there was a book called Rush to Judgment in 1966 where he obviously uh, says, you know, this was, this was done too quickly, the facts were not looked at, this uh, could not have happened this way. And uh, Fletcher Pudi, uh, who writes about JFK, CIA, Vietnam, Vietnam and plot to assassinate John F. Kennedy, also does pretty much the same kind of thing. And the idea is, it's one of the things that, that runs through a number of these, that somehow that there was an ex elaborate plot of all of these things. There were all these different groups that got together to make this happen. You know, so there were civil rights people on the one side and all that sort of thing. But on the other side, there were segregationists. There were people who wanted the military industrial complex as Eisenhower defined it, you know, to keep going for Vietnam to happen. There were Cubans who were upset about what did or didn't happen at the Bay of Pigs and all that. And there were a number of groups like that who had real reasons to be upset with Kennedy. So this is one sort of source of, of that whole thing. And this is just one of the several books on this particular thing. Jim Garrison, um, if you saw the movie JFK, his, uh, his, he was portrayed in that particular thing. And um, Jim Mars, a book, uh, man who did a book called Crossfire, the, the plot of Kennedy. I recently watched the film version of that, uh, which is sort of interesting. He's sitting like he's, I don't know, on his way out to 100, something like that. But anyway, he's sitting there and he goes ahead and goes through all the different things, all the different problems. Well, this happened, why did that happen, all that. There are a number of people who look at things that way. Those two books in particular influenced Oliver Stone's 1961 film that I mentioned to you just a second ago with, about Jim uh, Garrison's investigation and trial. Jim Garrison was the, of course, in New Orleans. Kevin Costner played the lead role. Garrison raised these issues, and I'll, yeah, I'll try and read them quickly here. Five days before the assassination, uh, the New Orleans FBI officer did a telex warning that an attempt would be made to, to uh, assassinate the president of Dallas at the end of the week. The Bureau didn't do anything about it. They didn't pass it on to anybody else. The great majority of witnesses at Dealey Plaza in Dallas heard repeated fire coming from the grassy knoll, which I pointed out to you earlier, uh, in front of Kennedy. Uh, in the chase, the father of the Dallas police apprehended three uh, men and marched them away under gunshot and shotgun arrest. However, the numerous uh, new photographs of their arrest were never published and no record remains of their mug shots, their fingerprints, or their names. This is a pattern that a lot of people see. Things happen and they disappear. I'll get to more of that later. For more than five years, the assassination, uh, the film of the assassination taken by Abraham Zapruder was concealed from the public and kept locked in a vault by Life magazine. The moving pictures showed Ken smiling backward, and according to Garrison, this is clear evidence that the being is shot by a rifle from the front rather from the back because the uh, 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 oddball was up in that sixth floor the Scuba Depository. Uh, Pirate Clinton, an hour after the arrival of Kennedy Motorcade, Jack Ruby, the, um, the man who murdered, who later murdered Lee Oswald, was observed along the grassy you knoll unloading uh, a man carrying a rifle in the case. The statement of Julian Mercer, witness to the event, was offered by the FBI to make it appear that she had been unable to identify Ruby as the man. The fraudulent operation had never been explained or even denied by the federal government. After the president's body was subjected to a military autopsy, the brain disappeared. The brain, which is still missing after 25 years, is an older book. 
uh, had been immersed uh, in formaldehyde to harden it and might have shown the direction that it came. Photographs and x-rays of the autops autopsy, which might have resolved the issue, were never examined by the Warren Commission. The pathologist in charge of Kennedy's autopsy at Bethesda, Bethesda Naval Hospital uh, burned in the fireplace of his home the first draft of the autopsy report. One of the things that I thought uh, is, is interesting is that he, they weren't allowed to do the autopsy in Dallas. He was taken from there to uh, Bethesda Naval, and, and the people who did the autopsy, as some of the people point out, were not people who generally did this. These were military men and all that time that didn't generally do autopsy of that kind. So again, it's one of the issues that people raise about the whole thing. Um, reaction to Garrison and, and the other narratives and a lot, there are a couple of books on this, the Garrison cast and its, and its uh, case and its cast, and then False Witness, the real story of Jim Garrison's investigation and Oliver Stone's film, JFK. In other words, that didn't necessarily solve anybody's, you know, um, ideas of what did or didn't go on either for that matter. But the Garrison case, although it's really interesting in a lot of ways, had garnered a lot of, of strange reaction. Somebody asked me specifically about the magic bullet, the single magic bullet and other stories. Uh, so let me do that because it fits into this section. According to the Warren Commission, three shots were fired by Oswald and JFK and Governor Ken, uh, Connolly uh, suffered a total of, of eight wounds. The magic bullet struck Kennedy and then went on to hit Connolly. And there's an elaborate diagram of it you can see in some cases. I didn't get a chance to put it in here. According to several conspiracy theories, however, there were at least three shooters positioned in Dealey Plaza, and this is why there are several wounds. If you see the um, movie, I think it's Executive Action, with Burt Lancaster and Robert Ryan, for example, that's one of the things that they do and have the sort of triangulation. They can pay, pay, have people here and here and here, so they can go ahead and have this assassination happen the way they want it to. Uh, a guy named James Fetzer uh, identifies six shooters, and this sort of gives you an overview of the kinds of elements that they're talking about. A deputy sheriff, uh, Harry Weatherford, uh, Jack, uh, Lord Jack Lawrence, a U.S. Air Force expert, Nestor Tony Izquierdo, an anti-Castro Cuban recruited by the CIA, Roscoe Wade, a Dallas police officer with ties to the CIA, Malcolm Mack Wallace, who appears in a book that I'll talk about later, by the way, was shot from, uh, who shot from the uh, book depository and may have murdered a dozen people for LBJ. He appears, like I said, in, in a novel that I'll talk about towards the end of this thing. And Frank Sturge is later complicit in the Watergate robbery. He also appears to have been connected to the CIA. So in many cases, it's a matter of the CIA and the FBI, as well as others. Uh, Kennedy was spoken of as being interested in doing away with the CIA, for example, and that's supposedly part of the reason for that. Uh, Nicholas Arnali, in a, a book, uh, in, in, the, in an article called Gunshot Wound Dynamics, Model for the JFK Kennedy Assassination, the, the article came out in 2018, explained how it could have happened, that the shot could have come from back and it would have made the head go back this way and all that. I won't read the whole thing out, but there's that. There's also a couple of other things that I'll, I'll mention a little bit later. The JFK X, the movie that I watched this morning, saw the crime of the century, and JFK the smoking gun. But there's a lot of other things. This one, in terms of who exactly uh, shot JFK, uh, Mortal Error and um, JFK the smoking gun. McLaren's book kind of builds on uh, uh, Bonner Manager's book and all that, and there's a film of the whole thing as well, I think, that Colin McLaren made. Their theory is that one of the, uh, one of the I think it was a Secret Service man who was up there grabbed a rifle and somehow they went off and that that's the shot that actually killed Kennedy. So it wasn't the assassin or anything like that, it was an accidental shot by one of them, and that's why it's been covered up. I'm not saying it's true, I'm just saying that there are two books out there and that film version of it. Linda B. Johnson, uh, I, what I wanted to do is kind of give a good sense of how some of the people from here sort of fare. Linda B. Johnson had an interesting play called McBird, which is a version of Macbeth, uh, with Linda B. Johnson as, a, as the title character and all that. And it's illustrated and it's sitting in my car right now, as a matter of fact. But anyway, uh, the idea is that, is that Linda B. Johnson would have had, you know, Kennedy have killed in the same way that Macbeth would have killed, you know, his uh, uh, predecessor and all that. A couple of other movies about, about LBJ, Brian Cranston played him in a movie called All the Way, and uh, Woody Harrelson in a movie called LBJ. Uh, Jackie Kennedy and Jack Ruby are oddly tied together. There's an interesting, couple of interesting uh, um, movies about uh, Jackie Kennedy, or she appears in a number of them. 
uh, down in Portland Place, and you can see in this where there's the, um, I guess, yeah, here, where this is the actual photograph, and then they tried to make them look like, so you can see the same suit and all that sort of thing. Jack Ruby, who ran the club I was talking about earlier, the Carousel Club and all, uh, he was supposedly, and I think it's written up this way in some cases, that he, he killed um, Oswald because he wanted to spare, you know, the Kennedys, the frustration, the anger, the, the, the sadness of having to come back and, and go through all this stuff and all that. So there was a, in some notes, it's a, it's a patriotic act. Lee Harvey Oswald himself has had a couple of interesting novels written about him. Norman Mailer's book is one like this. Don DeLillo's has written actually much more like a, a regular sort of novel. And it's kind of interesting to read it, but it, it contains a couple of different stories within it. So it's, uh, it gives you a sense of what Oswald was like growing up and the, the kind of bouncing around that he did in his life. The Oswald family, uh, Killing Kennedy, and Parkland are the two films that, that have some interesting things about him. Fatal Deception is a movie that was made about uh, Marina Oswald, and it stars um, Helena Bonham Carter. And it's kind of interesting, actually. Um, I, I did this talk in, in New Orleans, New Orleans, Louisiana, and the, uh, the fact is that they, I didn't get to go on it, but they've got an actual Lee Harvey Oswald New Orleans residence tour. So you can go on that and go to all these different places where he was and all that, because he and his family are tied in many ways to this. And if he's connected with the Cuban stuff and all that sort of thing, there are connections that they frequently make between those things as well. Uh, the novel I was talking about, which is not to sit down in the car, anyway, is one by Max Allen Collins. It's called Ask Not. And one of the things that it does that's sort of interesting, it seems to me, it talks about something called Operation Mongoose. It, it, was a, it had to do with the Bay of Pig invasion. And when that failed and other things failed, what happens is that a number of people start dying and all that. And there are actually books written about this about, and, and lists of, of you know, all the people that died. If you were a witness, if you said something, if you were connected in any way, chances are you ended up dead within a short amount of time. Max Allen Collins is just a mystery writer, pretty much. But anyway, in his book, what he does is that he has himself as a character tied with all the events of the time. He knew Marilyn Monroe. He was dating a Miss uh, Playboy magazine for November, as a matter of fact, and all that. And he hooks up somehow or other with Helen, um, um, <coughs> excuse me, with Dorothy Kilgallen. Um, not in a romantic way, they're just, you know, she needs help finding some things, and he's a detective who gets into all kinds of things and does everything, and owes an agency, uh, owns an agency, so he helps her go along and all that. What they do is that they go from place to place to place and locate all these people who have been killed or who have died. Frequently it's a matter of they supposedly committed suicide, although somebody committed suicide by shooting themselves in the chest five times, things like that, you know, so it's obviously, you know, something else is going on. But that's the idea of what goes on in that particular novel. It's entertaining in a way that not all of these things are. The character that's mentioned here, Mac Wallace, is one that I actually mentioned earlier in one of the slides where he was one of the ones that was supposedly a, a hitman for LBJ and was probably one of the shooters at the thing. This uh, last thing that I've got, um, the movie XJ of Cal talked about in a minute. This one, Paul Lance is the final witness of Kennedy, of Kennedy Secret Service agent breaks the silence after six years. It came out in October. And what it amounts to is that um, it didn't come out in time for the New Orleans talk, but it's, it's out now and I take a look at it and all that. What it amounts to is that this bullet he found in the seat of the car, he took it into the, um, into the hospital with him and all that, and he put it on, on I think, uh, on Conley's stretcher rather than the other place. And so it was misidentified, misappropriate. He'd said nothing about it. Uh, a guy named uh, Gerald Posner, who wrote a book called Case Closed in 1993, who says it was just the one man, et cetera, and all that, raises doubts about everything that, that, uh, that Landis says. And there's some interesting variations on what didn't, didn't happen all that. The movie I watched this morning I thought was very, very strange. Jay Wyden, in this film, argues that everything was faked. JFK did not die. Seriously, here's what he argues in that thing. There's a thing called a squib, where you do like this in a movie and all that, and it looks like a shot's been happened and all that, and blood comes out, and there's a little explosion thing and all that sort of thing, but nothing happens to the person. So he's saying that when Kennedy does like this in one of those shots and all that, one of the film shots and all that sort of thing, what he's doing is that and faking it. 
And when Jackie goes to the back of the, of the car, you know, the limousine to try and grab something, what she's grabbing is the metal plate that was connected with that, rather than a piece of the skull, which is what the other things that people say you know, happened and all that. Then the trunk actually had the body of J.D. Tippett, because they looked exactly like J.D. Tippett's nickname at the police station was JFK. So they had shot him earlier, had his body in the trunk, pulled it out on the way to Parkland, and then he's the one that they actually did the autopsy on, which explains some of the strangeness about some of the autopsy issues and all that sort of thing. In the meantime, JFK is hiding out, of course, in the trunk, and then they get him away. Uh, he did this because the mob and all these other people were out to get him, and his father knew about the mob because he apparently had connections and all that sort of thing. So they hid him away, and he was able to go to live on an island owned by, um, by uh, Aristotle Onassis, who has a later connection, of course, with the Kennedy family uh, and all that. And there's a little bit more to it than that, but that gives you an idea of where things can go. Okay. Um, I just wanted to cover a number of things. I'm not trying to draw any conclusions or anything like that. As you can see, it's probably kind of hard to do. Thank you.